All right, I think we're gonna get going here. Uh, good morning all, I'm Camille and I'm the head beekeeper here at Chenards. I know a couple of you know me already, so good to see you. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting hive inspections and problem solving. We're going to start out with the basics and then we're going to move on from there and we'll be covering uh, pests and diseases. Varroa mites will be included there at the end as well. So uh, hopefully everyone enjoys. So starting with why should we inspect the hive at all? In nature, bees take care of themselves and humans aren't really a part of things. Um, but a beehive isn't necessarily something that's going to happen naturally in nature. And there are pests and diseases and um, problems that occur now that humans have become involved in the picture. So part of taking care of your hive and knowing what types of problems they have comes with inspections. Uh, the more you're in the hive, the more you're going to know what's going on with the bees, how they're changing and how to help them. Um, seasonal tasks that the beekeeper will need to perform are going to be made much easier as they see the changes going on with their hives. So you're going to know when to add additional brood boxes. You're going to know when to add your honey boxes based on what the hive is doing in the time of year. Uh, feeding more or less frequently, depending on the activity and resource availability. Uh, even just having a hive in the front of your house and a hive in the back of your house, they're probably going to have different feeding requirements. Some may have more resources available to them and eat their, uh, their sugar syrup a lot slower. Some are going to just gulp it down and they're going to need heavier feeding. So your, your hive inspections are going to help you figure out where your bees stand there. Um, reducing or enlarging your entrance for ventilation or robbing prevention. Uh, most Langstroth hives, like you see here, have quite a large entrance, so having an entrance reducer can be um, really, really handy. It can also be detrimental if you don't use it properly. Um, harvesting honey boxes. You need to know when your honey boxes are full, when to add more honey boxes, and then when to take those out and, uh, and spin them or do gravity drains on them to harvest the honey for yourself. Uh, colony health and hive equipment. Colony health is really important if you wind up having an old queen, um, an injured queen, or just a poorly mated queen. You need to know about that so that you can change something and get your colony population to the point where it can overwinter. Um, also, hive equipment does wear out eventually, so it's a good idea to take a look at your frames once in a while and see where they stand. Sometimes the wood will rot, sometimes um, an end bar will fall off, or maybe the comb is improperly drawn and you need to replace that with a new frame. How often do I inspect? This is a pretty common question and there are a couple of different answers here. A lot of beekeepers will tell you if you inspect too often, you may disturb the bees and actually cause them to swarm. Um, also, if you don't inspect often enough, you could run out of space in your hive, you could uh, not catch a queen cell and they could swarm anyhow. So it seems that the perfect time to inspect your hive is once every two weeks, uh, once every 14 days during proper weather, because it takes an adult queen 16 days to hatch from an egg all the way down to an adult. So if you're checking once every 14 days, you have a pretty good chance that you're gonna catch a swarm cell and you'll be able to remove it and prevent your hive from swarming. Uh, most beekeepers, particularly in town, um, really don't want their hives to swarm. They wanna keep their populations up. They, they want to respect their neighbors and not have a huge ball of, tree, uh, ball of bees in somebody's yard. Um, proper temperature and weather conditions do matter when you're doing hive inspections. You want temperatures to be above 55 degrees. So that's warm enough that your foragers are out flying, you don't have a ton of bees in the hive, and you're not going to chill the brood when you're inspecting the frames. Too much wind is going to, one, make it hard for your bees to fly, um, two, make it easier to chill your brood, and three, just make them a lot grumpier, and you're not gonna enjoy the hive inspection with a ton of wind either. So try to go for favorable weather conditions. And when you're inspecting, if you're a new beekeeper, it's okay to take your time and really figure things out and become comfortable with your hive. But once you kind of know what you're doing and you know what you're looking for, try and limit your hive inspections to probably 10 or 15 minutes. 
um, just enough time to know that you have a healthy queen, to know that you have lots of eggs, lots of uh, resources for the bees, lots of space for them to expand and um, just put them right back where you found them. Um, disturb them the least amount possible. And this is probably one of my favorite photos from the Beekeeper's Handbook, uh, fourth edition. Uh, Diana Samataro and Alfonso Beatable. We have a new edition of it right now, edition five, but if you don't have this book, I highly recommend it. So frame hierarchy. If you're talking to another beekeeper, you have questions about particular frames in your hive, it's a good idea to know what all of the frames are named. So kind of like uh, squares on a chessboard, every frame has a name. Um, every box has its name too. So you have uh, brood box one, brood box two, and then honey supers one, two, three, and however many honey supers you have. Um, but this, uh, this photo is for a 10 frame hive and the frames begin with one and one on both outside areas. And then towards the center, you grow your numbers. So in the center of a 10 frame hive, your brood nest should be thickest at frames five and five. Uh, if you have an eight frame hive, you don't have five and five because you have two less frames. So your center frames are going to be four and four. Um, frames one and one are typically pretty empty. Uh, if you're seeing one and one fill up and you only have one brood box, that's definitely time to add another brood box because you don't want the bees to run out of room that will cause them to swarm and then you'll be down to about 30-40% uh, population. Um, frames two can be honey, pollen, maybe some brood. Uh, the brood nest isn't always centered and that's okay. The bees kind of do their own thing. Uh, but frames three through five on both sides, uh, three, four, five, five, four, and three should all be basically solid brood uh, when you have a full-size colony. So preparing to inspect, it's really important to have all the tools you need available to you at all times. Even if you don't think you're going to need a certain tool, just have it out by the hive anyway. Um, a five gallon bucket, an old nuke box, um, an actual tool belt, whatever you're most comfortable with, but carry your tools around with you. And that's going to reduce the time that you're gonna be in the hive as well, having the proper tools around. So, Minimum gear, you should have some sort of protection, um, a suit, jacket, veil, gloves, whatever you're comfortable with, make sure you have that around. Um, make sure you have your hive tool. I've got my blue hive tool here in this photo. I never go into the hive without it. Probably couldn't get into the hive without it. Actually, everything gets glued shut with propolis pretty badly. Um, smoker, a lot of people um, may try not to use a smoker or try to use a sugar syrup spray instead. I have my smoker on me at all times, whether or not I need it. And I give them a little introductory smoke um, just to announce my presence. And it really, really does help. It doesn't harm the bees at all. It just blocks the alarm pheromone and it keeps them calm. It also works better than a bee brush in my opinion for controlling the bees and moving them around. So that's it for absolute necessary tools. Um, you're, you're perfectly good with your protective gear, your hive tool, your smoker, but it's a good idea to bring a couple of extra things around. Um, bring some extra fuel, depending on the weather, you may go through fuel faster than other times. Um, a notebook is really great to have on hand. You can keep tabs on what the weather's like, the temperament of your bees. Are they angry today? Are they really calm? Are they kind of nervous? Um, keep tabs on how fast they're drinking their sugar syrup, uh, how much pollen they're bringing in, uh, what frames they're working, um, as much or as little as you really uh, want to put down, but it's nice to have a log book and kind of know what's going on throughout the year. Uh, sugar syrup, even if you're not going to feed, have it on hand, so that way if you do need to feed, it's right there and you can get it done right then and there. Um, several tools can make the job easier but aren't necessary. Uh, your frame perch, your frame grip, and your bee brush are some of these tools, but there's, there's a plethora of extra tools out there that can make the job easier. Inspecting the hive with an external survey. Before you even go into the hive, 
it's important to just take a look at the entrance for a couple minutes, see what's going on. Um, are the bees bringing in nectar and pollen? Can't really see the nectar and honey stomach, but it's very obvious uh, watching the bees come in with their pollen baskets full. Um, what kind of a mood are they in? Are they bearding if it's too hot? Are they preparing to swarm and facing outwards? Um, how many bees are coming in or out? Is it a good day for foraging? You, you can tell quite a bit just by looking at the entrance before you even go into the hive. Robbing behaviors are another thing that you should take a look at when you are doing your external survey. Um, robbing can be from several sources. Other honeybees could be trying to rob. Uh, ants could be trying to rob. Um, you probably won't necessarily see this, but raccoons, bears, things like that usually show up at night to try and rob. Um, and yellow jackets in the fall are particularly nasty robbers. So it's a good idea to keep an eye out for these and act accordingly if you do see robbing behavior. Um, let's see, a little bit on bearding here. Uh, bearding can indicate a couple of different things. It can indicate the hive is too hot. If you're having triple digits, it's too hot for the hive and all they're gonna be doing is they're gonna be hanging out on the outside of the hive, trying to fan inwards and trying to cool that hive down. Brood rearing at triple digits is going to completely stop. So if you're not seeing too much brood and it's been a heat spell, wait a little while until temperatures cool down to really start worrying about your queen. Um, if a colony is about to swarm, you're going to see bearding as well, but it's going to be different than the bearding you're going to see during a heat wave. So kind of keep an eye on that and see if you can tell the difference. Um, bees facing the hive are usually focused on cooling. You'll see them um, kind of with their butts in the air and their wings going crazy, trying to fan everything inwards. Bees facing outward may be preparing to swarm as well. So take a look for that. Um, opening up, new beekeepers have a tendency to be really excited to get into the hive and they just kind of go for it. There is a right and a wrong place to stand when you're doing your inspections. The only place you should not stand is directly in front of the hive, right in front of the entrance. The bees want to have a clear path for flight inwards and outward. They call it a, a bee line for a reason. They want about six foot area in front of the hive just to be completely open and clear. So don't ever stand in front of the hive. I like to stand to the side of the hive. Either side is fine. And some beekeepers prefer to stand at the back of the hive and this is completely fine too. I mentioned before that my smoker is my most important tool, second only perhaps to my hive tool. Um, before you actually get into the hive, before you open anything up, before you touch it at all, Announce your presence by smoking the entrance lightly. One or two good little puffs, just kind of give them an in introduction. Um, and then as you go to open the hive, smoke will be applied each time you open a new part of the hive. So when you remove the lid, smoke any um, ventilation holes that lead into the hive, get a little bit of smoke in there. As you take your inner cover off and you expose the frames, give them a little bit more smoke and then smoke as you need if they become uh, agitated or if you need to move bees from a particular spot that you'd like to inspect. And getting to know your smoker can be a little bit tough in the beginning. Um, I recommend lighting it just a couple of times when you're not getting into the hive, get comfortable with it, uh, find fuel that you really like. I really like burlap. Some people prefer to use uh, pellets or smoke sticks or even just pine needles they find on the ground. So just kind of figure out what you like and what you're comfortable with and what burns well for you. Did we have a question? I'm just going to put everybody on mute, but feel free to unmute if you do have a question, and I will be checking the chat window periodically as well. Um, opening the hive. It's important to stay organized, and it's important to not stick all of your hive material together, so you only have to tear it apart with your hive tool once. 
Uh, there is a bit of a method to the madness here. Uh, as you can see in the first photo, we have uh, just the telescoping top and we've set that um, on, on its top to the side of the hive. This is away from the entrance, so it's going to, uh, it's not going to hinder the bees at all. It's where you can reach it easily and it's going to be out of your way as you're doing your inspection. Um, this is also your work area. Uh, my telescoping top works pretty well for uh, excess burr comb and just things I want out of the hive. So I kind of pile things on top of my telescoping top as I'm going, going through my inspections. And then I'll get rid of all the burr comb and gross things and uh, toss them after I'm finished. But it's an excellent tray for anything that I need as I'm going through. Um, your inner cover, once you take that off, set that on top of your telescoping top, but tilt it a little bit so it's not touching um, as much as it could be. You want to minimize um, contact as much as possible, not only so you don't stick your inner cover to your telescoping top and have to pry it apart later, but also because this is going to prevent you from squishing a lot of bees, having the, the, the reduced surface area as well. Um, as you delve deeper into the hive, all the rest of your equipment is also going to be skewed on your telescoping top. So your brood box is going to be on here, your honey supers are going to be on here, everything that you're taking off so that you can get deeper into the hive goes on top of your telescoping top and kind of skewed one way or the other. So when you get into your hive and you're, you've got your frames exposed, take a look before you actually pull any frames and just kind of see what's going on. How full is the colony? How many frames does it look like the bees are using? Uh, do you need to add another box? Uh, the hives in this slide are both pretty full and I would consider adding a new box to both of them. Um, we have a full population here. I usually use the 70% rule. So uh, this being an eight frame hive, I would probably um, look for frames one and one to be empty. And at that point I would add another box. This hive is completely full. So I probably should have added another box to this hive already. Um, whiting on the tops, the photo on the left here, you're going to see this kind of burr comb happening when your colony is trying to rise up and they're running out of room. So you can scrape this off and the white wax like this is really useful for all sorts of cool things. You can make them into lip balms, you can make them into candles, or you can just crumple them up and toss them in the trash tube. Uh, it takes a lot of wax to do much with. So keep it in a mason jar or just get rid of it, but don't keep it around the hive because that could attract robbers. Creating workspace. The hive is set up in such a way that it's pretty cramped in there. So it's going to be difficult to move through and inspect each frames, uh, each of the frames when you have a full box. So removing one frame is gonna make your life a heck of a lot easier. Um, when you pull your frame, frames one and one, as we discussed in the frame hierarchy, both frames on the outsides are usually going to be empty. So that's a really easy frame to pull and set to the side. And if you don't have a frame perch, you can lean it up against the back of the brood box, like I've got in this little figure here. Or if you do have a frame rest that hangs off the side of your hive, uh, you can put up to three frames in your frame rest and that's going to create quite a bit of space and you're going to have lots of room. It'll just make your life a lot easier when you're doing your inspection. Are you, when you're taking out up to three, are you taking out one and one or you're taking out one of the ones and then making room and then starting to look at the frames next to it? You can take out frames one and one. I would recommend taking out frames one, two, and three. It's easiest to keep it in order that way. You don't really have to think too much about which frame you pulled from where. Yeah. So one, two, and three is what I always do. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And I'm going into a little bit more detail here on uh, which frames to move and how we're moving them. Um, so in this graph, I've decided that I don't have a frame rest. I send, so I've pulled frame one, I've set that to the side. And as I go through my inspection, inside the hive, I'm moving frame two into the frame one position, 
so that I know that it has been inspected, it's out of the way, the bees aren't going to move from frame two onto a frame that I haven't inspected and vice versa. So as I go through, each of those frames are going to be moved over. And then as you see in the figure on the right here, I have frames two, three, four, and five, which have been inspected. And then the rest are still to be inspected. So this helps keep me organized. And once I'm finished inspecting, all I do is I take the ears of the frames, gently lift a little bit and slide them back into their correct position. And I don't have to take any frames and reorganize them that way. So it, it's really easy to, to go through the motions this way without moving your brood nest around. So looking at your frames, before you even look at what's inside the cells, you can look at the wax itself to tell a lot about what is going on inside your hive. Um, really light colored white wax right here, like you see in this left-hand photo, um, is brand new. They've just drawn this out. It's only probably a day or two old. Um, it's not going to stay like that for very long. After a while, you'll see one of two things happen to the comb. This middle photo here is a resource frame. So you're going to see honey and pollen primarily on it. And it gets kind of a, a golden color to it, not only because of the nectar and the pollen itself, but because the bees are walking over the top of it. And eventually, uh, if you walk through your house enough, it's going to get kind of dirty. Um, the photo here on the right is a photo of an older comb. Uh, older comb tends to darken as it ages no matter what it is but this comb has uh, kind of a black color to the inside of it. And this is a brood frame. And the reason why brood frames darken so much more than your resource frames is because the workers can't quite reach the bottom of the, the, bottom of the cells. As um, a new worker emerges, she'll shed her cocoon, come out, immediately clean her own cell, but she can't reach the very bottom. So there's little bits of remnants of a cocoon down there and it just kind of gets dirty after a while. Uh, these frames can be reused for a couple of years, but after a while, the comb isn't going to be quite deep enough. They will potentially build on top of it and just kind of make a mess. So after two or three years, it's a good idea to replace your brood frames. Let's see, outer frames. Uh, we're talking frames one and two here, the yellow frames in this figure. These are resource frames primarily. Every now and then your queen gets a little confused and she moves her brood nest to one side of the hive or the other. That's all right. And you can swap some resource frames over to move it back to the center, as long as you keep your brood frames in order and you don't separate the brood nest. Resource frames, you can move. Brood frames must stay together. Um, and these resource frames are either going to be empty as one and one typically are, at least on the outer sides, um, or full of resources. When you have a full-size colony, you've got two boxes on. Most of the time, frames one and two are either going to be solid honey, like you see in both of these photos here, or they're going to be a mixture of honey and pollen. And um, you're going to figure out pretty fast here. You don't even have to look at the frame as you pull it. You can just pull it out an inch and realize, oh yeah, that's a honey frame. The honey frames are probably a good five pounds, so they're significantly heavier than your brood frames. Um, intermediate frames, frames three and four, these frames are going to be kind of adjusting from resource frame into the brood nest. The brood nest is typically very spherical, so you're seeing the outer frames with just kind of the end of that sphere. Um, this is a perfect brood frame uh, for an outer side right here. You have kind of what's called the, the rainbow of resources. The upper band here is full of capped honey. Uh, you can tell that the honey is different from the brood because the, the, the wax cappings over the honey look kind of wet and they're kind of sunken a little bit, whereas the brood are nice and dry and they're actually puffed out a tiny bit. Um, so band of nectar up here, band of pollen, and the pollen is really cool because you can kind of tell um, what time of year it is by looking at the colors of the pollen. It takes a little while to get used to, but there are so many different colors out there. Um, you can find the bright red pollen from the maples. You can find bright blue pollen actually from Columia, which is kind of cool too. 
um, native plant as well. So those of you who like planting native plants might consider it. And then you've got your patch of brood right here in the center. Everything on this frame looks beautiful. In your center frames, you're going to see the center of your, your brood sphere. And these frames should be more or less solid brood. You want um, solid brood, like I said, but you'll see that there are little patches here where bees are hatching out. And that's okay. If you look inside here, you'll usually see fresh eggs that the queen comes back and lays. Brood stages. Um, I was lucky enough to start a hive on absolute fresh comb, so I got some really good pictures here. Um, black foundation, brand new white comb, you can see the larva and the eggs really clearly on a setup like this. Um, when you're looking at your frames and you're seeing eggs, you don't have to find the queen because you know she's there. She's been there in the last 36 hours. That's about how long it takes for, um, for the eggs to hatch. Larvae are all under 10 days old. And this is actually a really cool way of finding eggs is start with your larger larva, find the larva and then go younger, 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 younger. And then right up here somewhere, you're going to find your eggs. So eggs are difficult to find. You're not gonna find them right away, but definitely start with a larger larva and move on to younger larva until you hit the eggs. And then after a while, you'll just be able to see them every time. Your capped brood is somewhere between 10 and 21 days old. Uh, once they're capped, it's kind of hard to tell how long they've been capped. But you'll start seeing uh, little scatterings of hatchings when they're about ready to come out. As far as queen status, I went over this briefly. Um, finding the queen herself is really fun. Every time I find her, I usually take a picture or two of her but you don't necessarily have to find her every time. And as you go through the season and drones become uh, more common, uh, full-size hive is gonna have probably about 10% drone population. It's gonna be really difficult, if not impossible, to find your queen in three or four boxes of bees. So you're looking for the eggs, you're looking for the brood in various stages of development, like I was mentioning here, and then you know she's healthy. Um, you should see each cell having one egg. You should see very solid patterns. It shouldn't be scattered eggs here or there. Um, you know she's been there in the last three days if you're seeing eggs. So if you're seeing eggs, you shouldn't have to worry about your queen at all. Um, the angle of the sun can be really helpful when you're looking for eggs too, particularly if you've got older comb, you kind of have to just get it right in order to see anything. Um, every now and then, when you get a brand new queen, like when you have a package and you, brand, you introduce a new queen, you'll see cells that have two eggs in them. And that can be a little bit worrisome, but sometimes when a queen is new, she's getting used to her egg laying pattern, she'll lay two eggs every now and then in the same cell. And that's not a problem at all. When you start seeing six or seven or even 20 eggs in a sing single cell, you have a big problem that's when you have a missing or injured queen and the workers begin laying. The problem with the workers laying is they can only lay unfertilized eggs, which are drones, and the colony can't survive with just drones. Um, so if you're seeing laying workers, you need to get rid of them and you need to get a brand new queen. But if you're seeing the occasional double egg, it's not a problem and your queen's just getting going. When you say, sorry, when you say get rid of them, you get rid of the cells with multiple eggs or get rid of the laying workers? The laying workers. Uh, the thing about laying workers, I've never actually encountered this before. So I don't have any practical experience on the matter, but I've done a little bit of reading and it seems that like the queen, laying workers are too fat to fly. So what you can do is you can take a frame that you think has laying workers. It is a, a frame with all the eggs in it. Take it 20 or 30 feet away from the hive and shake that frame and then return the frame to the hive. The laying workers won't be able to fly. They won't be able to make it back to the hive. All of the workers who are not laying workers will fly back to the hive. And that should fix things. Cool. In addition to uh, 
they're getting a new queen to replace them. Thank it's you. It's a pretty uncommon problem though. So luckily there's that. Inspecting brood frames to prevent swarming. Um, when a colony swarms, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a bad thing for the beekeeper who doesn't want to lose all of their population, but it's a natural part of a bee's life. It's when uh, the colony is doing really well, the colony is incredibly healthy. Maybe they're starting to run out of room or maybe they just feel they're strong enough to split. Uh, but what happens is the queen takes about 60% of the colony's population um, and they leave to make a whole new colony. So effectively, they're reproducing on a colony scale rather than an individual egg laying scale. But it's a problem for a beekeeper. Uh, so swarm prevention techniques are included in your biweekly hive inspections. When you go through, it's a good idea to take your box and set it on its side. That way you can just take a good look at the bottoms of the frames. The bottom bar of your frames are going to be the most likely place to see swarm cells. Like you see in both of these pictures here on the left, it's kind of difficult to tell on the top picture, but I have my whole box laying on its side and I can inspect each of my frames all at once. And we do have one swarm cell right here. It's not filled, so it's not a problem. And it's pretty common to have one or two swarm cells that are empty at any given time. Uh, just in case the workers like to have them around, but I'll scrape them out every time. Because if you miss it, like in this bottom photo here, you see a bunch of queen jelly in there. And it's really difficult to see, but there actually is a larva in there also. The queen will hatch within 16 days. And once you have a new virgin queen in there, swarming is basically inevitable. So get in there with your hive tool, scrape out all of those swarm cells and uh, add any boxes that you need as well. Queen cups don't always appear on the bottom part of the frames though. If you're looking um, on the center of a frame and you see a downward facing cell that's much lar larger than other cells, um, then that is a supersedure cell. When you have supersedure cells, it could mean that they're just going to swarm, but it could also be an emergency cell, say maybe the queen has had a problem, she's died or she's injured or something like that. When you start seeing swarm uh, emergency cells on the sides of the frames rather than on the bottoms of the frames, it's a good idea to really look for those eggs and see exactly what's going on because there's a possibility there's something wrong with your queen if you're seeing supersedure cells rather than swarm cells on the bottoms of your frames. Common frame problems. And when I say common, every time you go in, you're probably going to see one of these. Um, sometimes frames can be damaged and you need to replace them. If it's a resource frame, that's super easy. Just put the resource frame wherever it may be to position one or one, and then it will get less use and less use, and you'll eventually be able to pull that frame and replace it with a new one. Um, if you can't pull a frame, it's a, a brood frame or something like that, and you want to continue using it, but it's broken to the point where you can't really do much about it. Uh, the ears pretty frequently break on these wooden frames, and there are replacement pieces that you can just nail on and stick them straight back in the hive. Um, let's see. It's always a good idea to have a few extra frames on hand. So if you've got your toolbox with your smoker and everything in it, toss a couple of extra frames in there too, so you don't have to go back to the garage or the shed or whatever to get new frames when you run into these sorts of problems. Um, Sometimes you'll find wax in places you don't want it, like on this Vivaldi inner cover here. This is fairly uncommon to have bees drawing comb in a Vivaldi like this. Um, it's probably because they're running out of room and they need a new box. But in cases like this, you can um, just bump the bees back into the hive and you can use your hive tool and scrape all of this burr comb out. Um, excess drone comb is something that you want to get rid of as well. If you have an entire uh, frame just of drone comb, that's not gonna benefit your hive in any way. It's specifically for other hives. And 
drones are huge vectors for varroa mites. So you'll want to get rid of that comb and allow the bees to redraw the comb. Um, drone cells are visibly larger than worker cells. And once it's a drone cell, it is always a drone cell. So the only way to get the bees to start laying workers in a frame like this is to scrape the, scrape the comb and allow them to redraw it. And then at the bottom left here, we have a comb that is just terribly drawn. <laughs> we have a um, comb that isn't attached to the frame. We have comb that's irregular. It's gonna be hard for the queen to lay in this, and it's gonna be hard for you to locate bees that are going to be in between the frame and the comb here. You don't have to scrape the whole thing, but it's a good idea to get rid of the improperly drawn stuff. And on frames that are natural wax like this frame, sometimes you just have to throw the whole frame out and start new. But if this had a plastic foundation piece in it, you'd just be able to use your hive tool, scrape the whole thing away and put it right back in the hive. Seasonal feeding. Um, if you ask eight different beekeepers, eight different questions, you will get nine different answers. But this is the most common thing that I see, and this is the chart that I try to follow as well. Um, you don't ever want your bees to be without food at all. Even if they have food in the area, if they have lots of things blooming, keep some food around in case they need some supplemental food. The only time I stop feeding, and it's only a partial feeding that I stop, is during honey flow. So in early spring, Right when the rains start to slow, the temperatures begin to rise, but the bees aren't fully active yet. This is probably March, April. Um, I will feed a one-to-one -one sugar syrup, which will imitate a light nectar flow. It's going to get the bees kind of waking up. It's gonna get the brood rearing starting again. It's going to uh, cause them to draw some extra comb, increase their population, just help them get going for the beekeeping year. Um, late spring, when the rains stop, the bees become actually active and you really wanna start building up your number. So you want to swap to a heavier sugar feed. Bees will actually store a two to one sugar syrup. Um, so this will increase wax production. This will um, help with your frames actually filling up. If there's not enough resources uh, just in the area, they will fill the frames with uh, your sugar water. And that's exactly why I don't feed during honey flow. When you have your honey boxes on, you don't want them to fill the honey boxes with sugar water because who wants sugar water in their pantry? Um, during fall, we're going straight back to two to one sugar because you want them to store it, because you want them to have extra resources going into winter that they can harvest and eat during winter. Uh, this also kind of supplements the honey that you took during honey flow. And over winter, bees can't really metabolize sugar syrup. There's too much moisture in it. It contributes to moisture problems in the hive and they just can't really eat it. So during winter, I, um, I'm a bit lazy here. I swapped to dry granulated sugar. And you can see in the photos here, I just spread it over the tops of the frames so that it's easily available to the bees. I don't put it inside of a baldy cover where the bees can't really reach it. During winter, um, the bees aren't going to be able to move more than probably an inch or so in a day because they're, they're cold and they're clustered and they, they can't really move too much. So the closer you can get the food during winter, the better. Um, fondant is actually better than dry granulated sugar. It's fairly easy to make and you can put that on top of your frames as well. Um, check out YouTube. There's tons of different recipes out there. So take a look at the fondant and see what you think. As far as protein goes, um, I've only feed two different types of pollen substitute. Um, during the active year, I feed an 18% protein. This is enough protein to encourage your queen to lay extra eggs and keep your population going. Throughout different times of year, the bees are going to consume more or less of your protein patty. So use your biweekly hive inspections to kind of gauge how fast they're eating it and whether or not you should put a whole patty in your hive or half a patty or even just a little strip. If the bees have um, natural pollen available, 
and enough of it, they're not really going to eat your protein patty. The protein patty is uh, just a supplement. You don't ever want them to run out of it. If they're consuming it, continue feeding it. Uh, but I always have a strip in there just so I can gauge how much they are or are not eating. During okay. winter, I, oh, sorry. All right, if they aren't eating it, do you replace it at some point or you just? Yes. After a while, it kind of turns to this gooey mush. So after probably a month or so, it's not really something that they're going to want to eat, whether or not they have resources available. So I'll put a little bit of fresh patty on. But if they don't consume all of it, I'll put less protein on the next time. And then going into winter, I actually change my recipe for protein patties and I go to a winter patty, which is only 4% protein. It still gives the bees the nutrients they need. It supplements their food for winter time, but a 4% uh, protein content isn't going to force your queen to lay. So during the brood dearth, when your queen isn't laying, she doesn't need that extra protein, which is why I swapped to the winter patty rather than the, the mid season. All right, so that was your basic hive inspection. Now we're moving on to problems that you may or may not see. Um, not all of these are common problems, but it's important to know about them. So if you do run into something like this, you're not completely at a loss. Um, we talked about queen health, we talked about structural problems of hive equipment, but now we're going to go into pests, parasites, fungi, diseases, um, a lot of these have other diseases or viruses associated with them that can be warning signs and pointing towards them. So they all kind of connect. Um, a great indicator disease that's very visual is deformed wing virus. You will see bees with deformed wing virus who are deemed flightless, kind of scattered around the entrance to the hive you'll be able to see that on your visual inspection before you go into the hive. And typically varroa mites are the, uh, the disease that, that's happening. So when you see deformed wing virus, you likely have varroa mites in your hive, but it could be tracheal mites or a couple of other things as well. So definitely worth a closer look when you see this. Um, some diseases can be treated with chemical or cultural controls, requeening, medication, things like that. Others aren't so easy and require disposal or incineration of affected equipment. American fowl brood is the big one here. Not common, fortunately, but it is absolutely devastating. And a lot of states require um, state hive inspections, I think once a year. We don't have that here in Oregon, but that's why they were started in so many other states is because of American fowl brood. Um, as with many other organisms, stressed bee colonies are far more subject to infection. So if you keep a happy, healthy colony, you're not going to have to worry about this as much. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure here. So keep your colonies healthy, keep your colonies fed, make sure you've got an excellent location, um, good space to grow, and an integrated pest management schedule for varroa mites. Um, brood diseases. Brood diseases are typically pretty simple to spot because as you're doing your hive inspection, you're looking at your brood frames, there are clear signs that something is wrong. And usually you can see this right away and you can treat things like this. Um, foul brood and chalk brood are pretty recognizable when inspected. Um, chalk brood you can actually see on the outsides of your hives too. Adult diseases can be a little bit more difficult to detect, uh, particularly uh, nosema and dysentery, which can often get confused one between the other as well. Uh, American fowl brood. Uh, this is definitely the scariest brood disease out there. This is the disease where if you find it, you have to burn all of your hive equipment, singe it all, it can be reused after you burn it, but the spores from American fowl brood can last something like 80 years. So if you don't burn and you introduce a new colony into the colony that had been killed by American fowl brood, it's going to continue in that new colony and it's gonna to spread to other colonies. 
Um, cool thing about foul brood is it's kind of self-explanatory. It smells awful. One of them smells really, really acrid. The other one is just completely putrid. Um, American foul brood, it'll send you through a barbed wire fence. It's, it's bad. And my nose is decorative, it's bad. <laughs> um, cases of American foul brood, you can tell the difference between American foul brood and European foul brood by looking at what has happened to the deceased brood. With AFB, deceased brood is going to be wet, sticky, shiny, and stringy. This makes it incredibly difficult for workers to remove and clean the cells that are infected, which is what makes this disease so devastating. Uh, the beekeeper can test for American fell brood with what's called the ropey test. You can take a toothpick or a stick or a pine needle or whatever you have on hand um, and just stir up the dead brood and remove that toothpick. If you can get the brood out of that cell for an inch without it breaking, then it's more than likely American foul brood. Uh, the brood pattern is usually scattered and irregular. The queen is having problems when foul brood is in the picture. Uh, your brood's going to die upright in the cells. Oftentimes you'll see the proboscis or the bee tongue sticking out in this disease and the larva turn dark brown and black. When you have American foul brood, what you do is you dig a big hole and you light a fire and then you set all of your frames and your equipment, uh, your boxes, and you incinerate the whole lot of it. Once it's singed, you can be sanded down, repainted and reused, but it has to be burned in order to kill those spores. Um, I'd probably recommend doing a serious clean on all of your protective equipment if you see this as well. Might wanna get new gloves entirely, maybe even a new suit. Um, if it's caught early, there is chemotherapy that can help. It's not going to cure bees that are already infected, but it will stave off um, American foul brood until all of the infected die off, can be cleaned, and then eventually uh, the colonies kind of not necessarily cured, but renewed. You do need a licensed veterinarian to procure this, and I think you can treat it yourself, but I've never actually had anyone use foul brood disease chemotherapy that I've had the chance to talk to. European foul brood shares a lot of symptoms with American foul brood, but is far less devastating and can actually be treated by the beekeeper. You don't have to incinerate your equipment with this disease either, which is fortunate. Um, a lot of people may choose to do it anyhow because American and European fall brood are similar enough that it is possible to have a misdiagnosis. So the easiest way to do it is just to burn everything and start from new, but you don't have to burn with American fall brood. Instead of the larva being stringy and wet, um, sorry, uh, European fall brood has kind of scale-like dry larva, and they're going to die twisted in their cells rather than upright with proboscises out. Um, the broods start out kind of creamy and brown, and then they turn black as they dry. Um, healthy larvae, as you saw in pictures before, are clean and white, um, kind of pearly even. So when you start seeing these discolored larvas dead in the cells, you know something's very wrong. Um, the European foul brood can be treated by requeening with a hygienic queen. This is doing two things. This is providing a new queen, which is going to lay new clean larva, and it's also creating a bit of a brood break. So you're having the old infected larva essentially go away after you uh, squish your, your original queen, and then you're replacing it with a new queen. The workers have a chance to clean out the old cells. The new queen lays new larva, and eventually you're going to have a clean hive if you catch it soon enough. Um, I think I mentioned this before, but deformed wing virus as seen over here on the right is a big red flag. When you see this more often than not, other, um, other forces are working on the hive. Uh, most likely it's going to be because of varroa mites. Varroa mites are a huge vector for deformed wing virus. 
Uh, controlling robbing and drift, good mite control with medication can uh, help prevent this. Uh, nosema and dysentery, both adult diseases. Um, the bees typically get things like this in the early spring on really wet years. So this is unfortunately a really great year for seeing nosema, dysentery, things like that. When the bees are cooped up in their hive for long periods of time, they, they don't like to use the bathroom in their hive. They want to go out and fly and have cleansing flights and come back in. So when they hold it for that long, problems happen. There are a couple of things you can do to negate these problems and to uh, just help keep your colony happy and healthy. We have here on top of our, our hives, just some extra boards. It gives them probably six or eight inches uh, of dry space. So even if it's pounding down rain, the bees can exit the hive, relieve themselves and go back in. This is going to help significantly. Um, extra ventilation helps, getting some good airflow through the hive. Uh, requeening can also help, but uh, when, you're, when you're having these problems, usually it's gonna be kind of hard to get into the hive but you're going to see lots of fecal streaking on the outsides of the hive when these problems become severe. Um, uh, what's it called? There is a treatment for this called Fumadil B. Some beekeepers will still use it and it's just something that you add to a sugar syrup solution which can help um, cure nosema, but there are some reports that uh, it has lost efficacy in the years since it's been produced as well. Here's the big one. Uh, varroa mites are something that every beekeeper needs to worry about. Uh, varroa disruptor came to the US, I believe in 1997. It's a worldwide thing. So um, you, you can't really just move somewhere to get away from varroa mites. They are everywhere at this point. And it's the biggest problem for bees. Um, it may not be, uh, it's not American fowl brood, but it is equally as devastating. Mites are almost always going to be in your hive because the bees will move to different flowers where bees from other colonies have come. The phoretic mites, the mites on adult bees, will move from adult bee to flower to the next bee to the next hive. So if you have a hive within flying distance of another hive that has varroa mites, they're going to share. Um, if you are 20 or 30 miles out in the middle of nowhere, there's a potential that you could get a clean hive and keep it clean. But most beekeepers are within probably 10 miles of the next hive. So it's paramount that you need to, you need to take a look at um, your varroa mite populations and treat them as need be. Um, mites are, mites are worse some years than others. Last year we had a pretty, pretty rough year, particularly going into winter. Um, I think we're treating once every two months now, except for during honey flow. There are very few treatments you can use during honey flow. So try and move your pest management cycle around so that your honey flow is in between mite treatments. Um, there are a couple of ways you can learn to spot mites. You can use an alcohol wash, which involves um, culling probably a cup or two of bees, that's around 300, uh, swigging them around in alcohol in a mason jar or a, 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 a varroa mite counter. And then you can count the mites that fall off. Uh, the alcohol causes the mites to release the bee and fall to the bottom. If you have at any one point uh, more than about three varroa mites on your mite board here that you've left inserted for four days, that's when you need to treat. This was actually a really nice mite board right here. You can read it like a map. You can see in between each frame here. And you can see all sorts of debris, uh, pollen that's dropped off of uh, honey, the, the pollen baskets. You can see wax cappings from uh, uh, bees that have hatched out. You can see some little bit of uh, fecal material, just things that the bees have dropped. And the varroa mites, as they die from the brood, are going to drop down here as well. 
everything on your mite board that is a mite is going to be dead. Live mites are not going to be seen here. But this mite board was really fortunate. I only found one mite on the entire board. At this point, I could choose not to treat, but if I saw three mites, then I would definitely treat. And it's a good idea to employ a variety of strategies for mite treatments. It is possible for varroa mites to become resistant to a treatment that you've been using for too long. So try and kind of rotate them out. And depending on the season, depending on your brood uh, situation, you may want to use a different mite control. We only carry natural mite controls here at the store. We don't carry Epivar, which is a chemical treatment, uh, because mites are more likely to become resistant to the chemicals. So we use Apigard, Hopgard, or Formic Pro, respectively. Um, as I said before, healthy hives are less likely to be afflicted by any sort of illness or parasite. So the stronger your hive is, the more likely they are to be able to fight off the varroa mites. Uh, keep your hives fed. If you have a supplement for your sugar syrup, use that. Uh, that can help as well. Um, there are cultural ways of getting rid of mites. It's not a standalone thing. It's something to use in addition to your, your treatments, but you can use what's called a drone frame, which is a plastic frame with just complete drones on it. There's, they're all large cells and only drones will be laid there. Um, you allow the frame to be completely filled by the queen with drones. Once those drones are capped, you immediately remove that frame, freeze it for three days. And then once it's still frozen, take it out of the freezer and scrape all of the the, the drones off. Uh, because varroa mites primarily reproduce in drones, you're going to eradicate quite a bit of your varroa mite population by using drone frames. Uh, usually you'll use one drone frame per box. So two boxes or, or two, two drone frames in a full size colony. But you have to make sure your timing is perfect if you're going to use this method, because if you let those drones hatch, you have two or three varroa mites per drone that you've just basically incubated and let, let go in your hive. So if you're going to use drone frames, they're a wonderful method of reducing your mite populations, but you can't let them hatch. Um, effective monitoring uh, can include in-hive inspections, mite boards, uh, inspections of larvae and phoretic adults. And I think, yep, mite treatments on the next slide here. Um, let's see. Already went over proper feeding, healthy bees are happy bees. Uh, your supplements that you can add to your sugar feed, like Pro Health, have shown some benefit in some situations. I still haven't seen too many reports that prove this is an actual benefit. The studies are still being conducted, but a lot of people do swear by them. Um, and one bottle will go quite a ways. It'll last you a couple of years, I believe. Um, mite control, as far as integrated pest management, I've been treating about once every other month. Um, and once every other month is going to change a little bit based on the weather we're having. Um, I like to use Timol, which is Apigard, uh, when I have a broodless colony, um, because it does take two treatments to treat a, a hive that has brood. The Timol is not going to get through your wax cappings. So if you don't have brood, it's a two-week treatment. If you do have brood, this is a four-week treatment. That being said, going into the new beekeeping year in early spring, I try and stick to formic acid. And that does get through my wax cappings. It's a very strong natural um, uh, mite treatment. And it has a nice uh, low temperature as well. It's really important that you know the temperature parameters when you're treating and you know how much treatment to add. Formic acid is between 50 and 84 degrees. Below 50 degrees is not going to be as effective because it is a fumigant. It requires some heat to actually fume off and uh, penetrate all of your wax cappings. 
above 84 degrees, it is a very strong treatment and you run a pretty high risk of damaging your brood and you could even kill your queen if you use it when it is too hot outside. Um, formic acid also uh, being a strong treatment, you really have to take into account how large your colony is. If you just got a brand new nuke and it's been two weeks and you're ready to treat, uh, formic acid, uh, formic pro here, this product is going to tell you that a full dose is two strips, but that's considering you have a full size colony. When you have a brand new nuke that you've installed, you've waited two weeks and you're ready to treat, that's not a full size colony and you're only gonna use one strip. If you use two strips, you run the risk of having significant brood interruptions or possibly even killing a lot of larva and your queen. So keep into account, um, use the proper amount, use the uh, treatments within your temperature parameters and take into account whether or not the treatment you use will penetrate your wax cappings. Hot beta acids last for a pretty long time. They are hop guard or the strips that go over the tops of your frames. These work with um, actual bee traffic. In order for your hop guard to work, your bees have to actually walk over the top of the strip here but they can be used in pretty cool weather. So they can be something that you can use uh, in early spring or in, uh, in late fall. They can be used up to 92 degrees. And they, if you look really, really hard, you, you can see that they're most effective around 50 degrees, but I've heard of lots of people having success at much lower temperatures as well. Um, oxalic acid, we can't carry oxalic acid because it does require a significant amount of personal protection gear, but it can be very effective during winter because you can use it at exceptionally low temperatures. Um, you're more limited by temperature um, trying not to chill your hive than limited by the efficacy of oxalic acid due to temperature. So a lot of people will use this as a winter treatment when your hive is broodless. Those temperatures, are they applicable for the entire time the treatment is on? So if I, I'm within the temperatures, but, and the treatment is on and two days from now, all of a sudden it's hundred degrees, do you wanna go in and take that out? That's a really good question. And this does differ from beekeeper to beekeeper. Um, the time where each of these treatments is most active is within a three day period. Okay. So I would definitely look three days into the forecast and make sure your forecast is within these parameters for three days solid. Um, after three days, if it gets to 85 degrees with formic acid, I wouldn't be terribly worried, okay. um, but definitely for three days. Thank you, that was a really good question. Thank you. So I guess we're kind of wrapping it up here a little bit. Um, so learning to read your hive, conducting consistent inspections, um, just kind of knowing your colony inside and out is not only going to help reduce your losses, it's also going to help each inspection to be easier. Your frames aren't gonna be stuck together. You're not gonna be as frustrated when you do your hive inspections if you keep them regular. Um, do your regular biweekly inspections, prevent your swarming, make sure everybody's happy and healthy. The better you know your bees, the better you can help them. And uh, a lot of issues that could infect your hive are not going to be a problem just for your hive, but they're gonna be a problem for other hives in the area as well. So it's important not only for your hive, but for your neighbor's hive to keep up on your hive inspections and make sure everyone's doing great. Uh, I know that was quite a bit of information and we are gonna be posting this on YouTube uh, probably later this week. But uh, I do also do local in hive consultations. So if you're within about 10 miles, I'd be happy to come out, do a hive inspection with you. Um, any questions that you have, I'd be happy to answer as well. And I think we've just about got that there. So uh, thanks everyone. I've had lots of amazing questions and you guys have been great. If you have any questions at all, feel free to pop into the store, uh, send me an email or call me on the phone. And uh, at this point, I would like to open it up to any additional questions.
Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. Oh, I guess I've got one more thing for everybody. If you'll take a look at the chat window here, um, I do have a second portion of this class happening next Sunday at either 9 or 9.30. And there's a link at the bottom where you can sign up for it, but I'm actually doing an in-person demonstration for free. Um, so we'll be getting into the hive uh, right here at Chenard's and going through an actual in-person hive inspection. So hopefully there's some interest for that and it'll be a lot of fun. I think I'm going to call it for the day. Uh, thank you again and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, very much. It's very informative. Thank you.